Well, welcome everybody. This is our final webinar of the season for our high tunnel producers. Um, today we are bringing together two of my groups, the high tunnel producers and also the master gardeners for this joint session. And we are going to focus on spotted wing drosophila. Oops, sorry. So spotted wing drosophila is an invasive insect that is causing big problems for us. And it, it's really just amazing considering how small this insect is. Um, this vinegar fly is only about two to three millimeters long. And it was first detected in the continental United States in 2008. Prior to that, they had spotted it in the Hawaiian Islands in the 1980s, but it didn't give those Hawaiian fruits many problems. You know, if you think about those Hawaiian fruits like pineapples, papaya, mango, they have a pretty thick skin. So we didn't think much of uh, Drosophila suzukii until it showed up in the continental United States. <clears throat> but since then, uh, this insect has been a game changer for us in two different aspects. First, it has been how rapidly it has spread across the whole United States and the unique type of damage that it causes. So spotted wing Drosophila was first detected in California, and in fact, the head of IPM for California totally missed the boat on this one. I heard him speak. You know, they've been worried about fruit flies for a long period of time in California, but they've never seen anything quite like this. Uh, so by 2009, it had spread across most of California and up the Pacific coast to Washington, and it, it was introduced into Florida. By 2013, it was in most of the states. Now, we, we might have some participants from South Dakota that are listening today. Um, I want to tell you that, yes, South Dakota does have spotted wing drosophila, so it's really pretty much the whole United States at this point. <clears throat> We have a map of spotted wing drosophila distribution in North Dakota. Now these are the counties that have submitted samples where we were able to identify uh, spotted wing drosophila. But we've got a lot of gaps here. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that it is the vast majority of North Dakota at this point. Now, before you can learn how to manage spotted wing drosophila, it's very important to learn how to identify them. We have a lot of different drosophila species that are not a big problem. It's just the spotted wing drosophila that is such a huge problem for us. Now, the male and female flies look very different. The male fly has this spot on its wing, hence the name spotted wing drosophila. Now, the females, however, lack this spot. Uh, the flies are two to three millimeters long, and then it has this unique golden brown color with red eyes. Now on, on the males, you'll see that the bands are across the abdomen. So that's the, last, that's the last segment of the fly. But you can see they have continuous bands here as opposed to spotted bands. With the males, one other way of confirming you have spotted wing drosophila is looking at it under a microscope. You'll see that it has these combs of hair on its forelegs, and that's quite dispositive of spotted wing drosophila. The female looks a little bit different. You'll note that the female does not have that spot on its wing. Um, instead, it has what I call the specialized weapon of destruction. And that's called an ovipositor. So an ovipositor is an egg-laying device. Now, all Drosophila species have an egg-laying device, but this one is special. So you'll notice it's got a serrated edge on, <clears throat> on the ovipositor. And this is absolutely amazing in that the female can drill into relatively hard fruits to lay eggs. So this has been, you know, part of the reason why it's such a game changer. You know, it's spread across the United States, and it can attack fruits that are just starting to color up, just starting to ripen. Now, in the past, we didn't have to worry about a lot of fruit insects in the northern Great Plains until the fruits were ripe or maybe even overripe. 
Now you can see some of the damage here. Now Kathy Wiederholt um, is one of our collaborators and she has provided some of these beautiful photos. Here we've got some tart cherries. You can see the Oh, you can see the puncture marks that were created. Um, now, spotted wing drosophila can lay its eggs in fruit that is just starting to turn color, but it will also lay its eggs in ripe fruit, too. But here you see the puncture marks, and that's a problem. These puncture marks, not only are there eggs in the fruit, but it also introduces rot fungi and yeast. So the fruits, the fruits then start to degrade. So you can see this photo here. <clears throat> We've got multiple puncture marks, and then we can see this, uh, this pupa that is right in the middle. So I, these are on June berries. <clears throat> so the life cycle of spotted wing drosophila is extremely fast. So the female lays her eggs, and then the eggs hatch within a day to two days. The larvae then start consuming the fruit from the inside out. So you can see the little larva here in the center of the fruit. It's very tiny, very hard to see. But the larvae start eating the fruit, and we'll talk about the fruit hosts here in a minute, but start consuming that, and the, and the fruit just starts to collapse. So after the larvae um, feeds, it then pupates uh, before it then becomes an adult. So when it pupates, sometimes it pupates on the surface of the fruit, sometimes it drops to the ground. Now we can go through multiple generations. Now we have no idea how many generations uh, occur in North Dakota at this point. Now we've heard in other countries it can have 13 to 16 generations, but right now we don't know how many generations. But if conditions are right, like 77 degrees Fahrenheit, the, the whole life cycle can take eight days, and that's just absolutely amazing. <clears throat> so here are some photos from Ash Seal. He is the entomologist at University of Georgia, but he wanted to see the progression of damage in a blueberry. So he took a photo once a day. So 5A is a photo of the fruit just as the fly has laid its eggs. By the second day, there are breathing tubes. Um, which enable the insect to survive in the fruit. By day four, you start seeing a little bit of an indentation, which just enlarges in day five and day six. By day seven, you know, there's just not much left of the fruit. But you can see how fast that progression is um, in a soft skin fruit. <clears throat> so our horticultural host range in North Dakota is pretty broad. That's another factor. Um, with spotted wing drosophila. It likes any of the cane berries, so your raspberries and blackberries. Now, we don't have much blackberry production in North Dakota, but certainly there's some in southern Minnesota and in South Dakota. It absolutely adores tart cherries. Uh, it'll go after June berries, strawberries. It's been reported in hascaps and aronia, plums, and currant. Now that's just, that's just a, a short list. There's quite a few more, but it can also attack grapes. Now fortunately, grapes don't seem to be a preferred host. It will go after tomatoes. And what it'll do with tomatoes it, is it will utilize cracks. So say for example, you've got a growth crack in your tomato, spotted wing drosophila will come in, exploit that situation and lay an egg in the crack. You know, the same is true for apples and plums. Um, but really, they'll go to anything. They'll lay eggs in an asparagus berry. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's those little berries that are produced in a female asparagus plant where the seeds are. It'll lay its eggs there. So it's been <clears throat> observed in over 60 plant species um, in 24 families. Spotted wing drosophila doesn't stop at... Um, at domesticated fruits. They'll also go after wild hosts. So they use these as bridge crops, you know, while they're waiting for, you know, your raspberries or something else to ripen. So they'll lay their eggs in choke cherries, autumn olive, elderberry, buckthorn, even buckthorn. You know, cl climbing nightshade, those little berries on dogwoods, honeysuckle, you name it, they will go after them. <clears throat> 
Now, timing is very important for us because it helps us understand, you know, what the damage is going to be in North Dakota. At this point in time, we don't think spotted winged Drosophila overwinters in North Dakota. Now, my uh, our PhD student, and I share a, a PhD student with Jan Knodel. Um, she has been studying spotted winged Drosophila for the last um, two growing seasons. So far, we have not found evidence that it overwinters. Instead, it seems to come north on some of the lower level jet streams, which bring spotted wing Drosophila adults to North Dakota. So for the last two years, our grad student has been trapping and has not seen any adults until about the first week in July. And that's when, when the trouble seems to kick in. So we've talked about how to identify the insect. We're gonna talk about um, <clears throat> what you can do once you know you have it in your garden. We're going to talk about integrated pest management. We'll talk about insects, uh, insecticides you can use, and then some other cultural methods that you can integrate, because I'm sure there are a lot of individuals that are not going to want to spray insecticides. So there's some ways of, of trying to deal with it. But I have to admit, this is one of the more difficult insects to control. <clears throat> The first step in any good integrated pest management program is to monitor to see when the insect arrives in your fruit orchard, you know, whether it's a commercial fruit orchard or, or your homeowner, uh, a home orchard. It's a very easy way to make homemade traps. You can use these little plastic deli containers. So you go to your grocery store, you can buy some potato salad from the deli, you know, take home these little containers and then clean them up for use. What you can do is drill some holes in the side. You want the holes about a third of the way from the top. This is where the spotted winged Drosophila can enter. And then you fill it up, uh, fill up the bottom one third or one quarter with a fermenting type liquid. Here we're suggesting one tablespoon of active dry yeast plus four tablespoons of water mixed in with 12 ounces of water. So this this is a fermenting type substance and it will draw in the spotted wing Drosophila. Now, if you happen to have yellow sticky cards, you can put a yellow, yellow sticky card in your trap and then look at that to see if there are any um, uh, Drosophila that um, get stuck to the yellow sticky card. If you don't want to use a yellow sticky card, you can add a drop of dish detergent to the trap the dish detergent will break the surface tension so the spotted wing drosophila will drown. But that means you then have to kind of sift out the insects in the liquid solution. <clears throat> As you're making your homemade traps, make sure you place them in a protected and shaded area. So this is one thing that's been a real eye opener for us as we've done research. Now this is an invasive insect, but it is really particular about the environment that it likes. Now my grad student has killed a lot of spotted wing Drosophila because we didn't quite realize how fragile it is. So it's been almost comical for us because we had a, a steep learning curve with this insect in trying to keep it alive so we could do tests with it. But what we have discovered is that it likes a shaded area, it does not like hot temperatures, and it doesn't like windy areas. So we were growing or keeping spotted wing Drosophila colonies alive in a growth chamber and they were dying because there was air blowing within the growth chamber. So if you want to trap these, put them in a protected area in your fruits, in the shade and a little bit out of the wind and then check the traps about twice a week. You will want to change the bait once a week and this is unfortunately a smelly job. Um, and when you change the bait, make sure you're not discarding the old bait near your fruit orchard because that will draw in the insects. You want to make sure you're, you are as, fa as far away as you can. If you desire, you can purchase commercial traps. We have purchased traps from Alpha Sense. So within that yellow sticky card, there's a, a, a pheromone pheromone lure that is hidden that draws in the spotted wing Drosophila and then we take a look at the sticky card to see if um, Drosophila suzukii is present. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about chemical management of spotted wing Drosophila. 
Now we've got you know quite a few individuals on. Some of you are in more of a homeowner situation. Some of you are commercial producers. So I'm going to give both homeowner and restricted use pesticide recommendations. Uh, restricted use pesticides are those in which you need to have a pesticide applicator's license to apply. Um, so we want to make sure that homeowners are not applying restricted use pesticides um, because in that situation you may be breaking the law. You do need to have a license and you can certainly apply through a li apply for a pesticide applicator's license, but there's quite a bit of training involved and a test that you need to take. <clears throat> Now, keeping in mind that I'm giving a regional seminar, not every pesticide that I am discussing today may be re registered in your state. Now, we have high tunnel producers from uh, a five a five state region that will be listening to this uh, presentation. So I have presented a broad list of pesticides. You will wanna make sure those pesticides are in fact registered for your home state. You will want to also see if it's labeled for your crop and whether it's labeled for a high tunnel situation or just outdoors. And then pay attention to re-entry intervals. So say for example, you spray your crop, how long do you have to stay away from it? You know, is it 24 hours, is it 48 hours? So take a look at that. And then consider pre-harvest intervals. So say for example, your raspberries are one week away from being picked, you don't want to apply a pesticide that has a 21-day pre-harvest interval. Obviously, you're not going to be able to harvest um, your insects, or harvest your raspberries. So you'll have to make sure you pay close attention to that information. <clears throat> For those of you that are in North Dakota, you can find out if a particular pesticide is registered for North Dakota by going to this website. And I will provide my my handout um, to all of you at, um, within a, uh, once we post our, um, our webinar online. So you'll have these notes and you can use them. Um, but for North Dakota, if you are looking up which pesticides are registered in North Dakota, you can use this website and then you can search you know, by product name or by active ingredient or one of these other search options. Now, I'm sure that for those of you that may be out of state, you have something similar through your own Department of Ag. But I wanted to show you a search result. So this happens to be a pyrethroid called Mustang Max. Uh, so I looked up Mustang Max. One thing to look for is, is it a restricted use pesticide in your state? Here it says Y for yes. So homeowners would, would not be able to legally apply an insecticide like Mustang Max. Um, now there's other information you can look up. You can look up the active ingredient in a, pro in a product. You can look at the pests that are controlled as well as which crops they can be applied to. So all important information. So we're going to start off first with homeowner insecticides. These tend to be, uh, I'm going to give you both conventional and organic insecticides. There may be a little bit of overlap in the organic portion with um, the commercial insecticides. <clears throat> now some of these are taken from our spotted wing drosophila extension bulletin. That's E1750. Um, Jan Knodel, um, and Kathy Wiederholt, and I are going to be releasing an updated version of this with more insecticides that are listed. So this shows you some of the insecticides that are labeled for homeowners in North Dakota. Now these happen to be the class 1A and 1B insecticides. You know, a caveat when you're applying insecticides is that you need to rotate between different classes of insecticides to avoid resistance. So, you know, say you apply a class one insecticide, um, the following week you would want to go to another class, maybe a class three or class five insecticide, and that will come apparent, that will be apparent as we uh, progress through this presentation. But here, these are class one insecticides. They tend to be organophosphates or carbamates. Active ingredients are usually either melathion or carbaryl. These are two conventional insecticides that are, are very common. 
that you can find at the garden center. You know, other class one insecticides um, are listed here. Now, I'm not going to go too too in depth into this because you know they change they change this quite rapidly, and each brand has its own version of this. But these are some of the brands that are out there, and sometimes you can find a combination spray that has insecticide with fungicide. So I mentioned very important not to just keep spraying one class of insecticide. Um, you know, it's just like antibiotic resistance. Um, we're worried about the, the insect here becoming resistant to the insecticide. So you would then, you know, rotate to maybe a class three insecticide. These are the pyrethrins. Uh, a pyrethrin is an organic product normally. Um, so it would be derived from a natural substance, you know, such as the pyrethrum flower. So pyganic is a very common OMRI certified pyrethrin, and it's labeled for a multitude of crops. It, it doesn't have a, a post-harvest interval, um, but the one problem is that it's only slightly effective. Um, we find that the conventional pyrethroids tend to be more effective on spotted wing drosophila. So these would include active ingredients such as bifenthrin, zeta cypermethrin, cyfluthrin, lambda sahelith sahelithrin. So these are some that Kathy Wiederholt um, had, had uh, found, but there's certainly other pyrethroids that are out there that are labeled for spotted wing drosophila. <clears throat> Now, the difference between these pyrethroids and the pyrethrin is that they may be a little bit more effective because they do have a synergist, which increases um, the residual on uh, the insects. However, these are not labeled for organic production. Other homeowner insecticides would be class 5 insecticides, um, and these would be the, the spinosads, I'm sorry, spinosids. So Monterey Garden Insect Spray and uh, Bonide Captain Jack's Dead Brew. So um, the spinosids are, are derived from a, a natural um, microbe, and they've been very effective um, insecticides. So Monterey Garden Insect Spray is OMRI certified. Um, the two Bonide products are labeled as organic. I didn't see an OMRI certification on them. But here you can, you know, rotate through a class one, class three, and class five insecticides. Now let's talk about insecticides for commercial producers. <clears throat> so these are the ones you would need a license to apply them. Um, so these are mostly re restricted use pesticides. There are some in here which can be applied by a homeowner, and I'll make note of those. But just like the pesticides we discussed previously, you need to rotate between the classes. Um, these pesticides, um, I have pulled them out of the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. Um, so for, for all of you commercial producers, you know, once again, you got to go through all these questions. You know, do you have a pesticide applicator license? Um, is that particular pesticide registered in your state and for your crop? And additionally, if you're a high tunnel producer, you've got to make sure that, um, that you're buying the right product. Um, if it's just labeled for field production, you're not going to be able to apply that product in your high tunnel. So you want to make sure that the product is labeled for high tunnels and or greenhouses. <clears throat> so once again, here's the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. Oh, this is a great guide. I wish NDSU were part of this, but we just don't have enough faculty uh, to do that. But a lot of great information in here on a multitude of pests. So this is what I'm relying upon for some of the uh, recommendations here. So I've pulled insecticides um, by a few representative crops. So these are insecticides you can apply to a plum. I certainly recognize that you're probably not growing a plum in a high tunnel, um, but he but I'm going to give you some different classes you can rotate through. Um, these are class ones, the organophosphates or carbamates. You'll notice that I've got some abbreviations. Now, these are ratings that come from that Midwest Fruit Producers Guide. Um, e stands for excellent control of spotted wing drosophila. G stands for good. F is fair. And P is poor. 
So you can see that for class one insecticides, imidin is a lot more effective than seven. If you get down to the neonicotinoids, a sale is available uh, to apply on plums, but it's only a fair, uh, it's got a fair rating, which means it's just moderately effective. You know, considering the problems we're having with neonicotinoids, maybe you might want to avoid that class of insecticides. <clears throat> We have a lot of pyrethroids available, and they provide excellent control. So we see Asana, Baythroid, Danitol, Mustang Max, Proaxis, and Warrior um, that are out there uh, labeled for plums. Now, there are other classes of insecticides for plums. Now, you've got some choices here with regard to uh, spinosids. Um, there's Delegate, which is a spinatorum. This is a conventional uh, spinosad. Uh, Delegate um, is supposed to be extremely effective. More, unfortunately, it's more effective than its um, OMRI certified cousin, which is Entrust. So if you're doing organic production, you're going to have to use Entrust rather than Delegate. Um, and then, of course, you're seeing Pyganic again. Pyganic is the organic pyrethrin. Um, so these are some plum insecticides that are available. The insecticides I'm listing on this page don't require a restricted, um, they're not re restricted use pesticides. Now I didn't list them under the homeowner insecticides because Delegate and Entrust are quite expensive, maybe prohibitively expensive for a homeowner. But we do see lots of commercial producers using these insecticides. When it comes to cherries, oh boy, oh boy, this is, this is a real challenge. Um, so I've talked a lot with Kathy Wiederholt at the Carrington REC, and it's been a real chore to keep ahead of spotted wing drosophila um, because the insecticides are in fact so, um, it's just so onerous um, on the applications that you need to do just to stay ahead of spotted wing drosophila. So once again, we've got different classes. We've got organophosphates, we've got neonicotinoids, pyrethroids, and then we've got others. You know, once again, Delegate and Entrust, but there's also XRL and APTA. <clears throat> now looking at um, uh, materials that have come from Michigan State, they were really dire in their warnings about um, cherry production. So they're telling you that in order to get tart cherries, or, or in Michigan State, um, of course, there would be some sweet cherries too. You got to start applying insecticides as soon as the fruit starts to turn color. And then when you're selecting pesticides, only select those that have an excellent rating. So they, they recommended the pyrethroids, imidan, exoril, and delegate. They then talked about high spray volumes, making sure you get full coverage and apply to every roll. And then they were advising six to seven day spray intervals. Um, I, I think that's really quite prohibitive for most individuals here. Um, now when it comes to raspberries, um, there's a smaller number of insecticides that are available, but certainly you can rotate between pyrethroids, um, class one insecticides such as malathion and seven, and you know others such as um, delegate and trust I'm sorry, organ, uh, Pyganic. From the University of Minnesota, this is what they've recommended for fall raspberry control. Um, so they're recommending the pyrethroids. They're saying no to the neonicotinoids. Apply delegate, melathion, and then have these. Uh, so you're rotating between the three products and then doing a five-day spray interval in the evenings. <clears throat> All right, so how many of you are, are not liking all the insecticides you have to apply? I would bet there's some of you that are just absolutely overwhelmed. Um, so that's why we're going to talk about other tools in the IPM toolbox. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about integrated pest management, what are some of the cultural controls that we can use? Well, um, we can take advantage of timing in North Dakota. 
if spotted wing drosophila doesn't show up until early July, we know that late summer and fall fruits will be a lot more vulnerable than our early ripening fruits and cultivars. Now we're studying this right now with my PhD student. Um, we, we received a specialty crop block grant from um, the Department of Ag. Uh, so we're looking at monitoring spotted wing drosophila on different crops. When do they first appear? You know, how, you know, how many are we finding in a trap? We're looking at which, which um, hosts they prefer. So will they lay their eggs in aronia berry and will the, uh, the will they progress through their whole life, life cycle on something like aronia or grape as opposed to their preferred crops like raspberry and cherry. And then we're looking at different differences in skin thickness. Will that make a difference? Now I'm not going to talk about all that today. Um, we don't have enough time here. I'm just going to focus mainly on trapping, which helps us kind of gauge timing. Now we are using the Alpha Sense yellow sticky uh, traps, which have a pheromone lure. And my poor grad student is counting the spotted wing drosophila that she finds on here on this yellow card. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Now the, obviously we've got big, big horse flies and all sorts of things on here. Um, spotted wing drosophila would be much smaller. So you can see it's quite a big job just to count the insects on each trap. But I wanted to give you just a little, um, just a little taste of this research in the hopes that it can inform you. So this is the data that um, Caitlin, our grad student, collected last year on HASCAPs at the Carrington Research and Extension Center. On the left-hand axis, she's got the average number of spotted wing drosophila that are captured in each trap. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this is measuring percent ripeness. So obviously, we don't want to see spotted wing drosophila arriving until after we have harvested. So we take a look at has caps. You can see that by or before June 30th, the has caps are at 100% ripeness and have been picked. And then we don't have spotted wing drosophila showing up until July on this on this particular figure. So this is good. Um, you know, based on this, I would say that has caps right now uh, stand a very good chance of ripening and being harvested before spotted wing drosophila shows up. So here's a crop that you can grow and not have to spray. Um, so I'll show you a couple other crops here. These are June berries. So Harleen is, I think, on, and we've been, we've been calling these July berries. They may be called June berries, but they don't seem to ripen here until July in North Dakota. But once again, we have kind of the same situation. We've got percent ripeness being shown by the blue bars, and then we have average number of spotted wing drosophila captured per trap. Uh, you know, so, so we get to... Um, just after July 4th, we start finding spotted wing drosophila, and then, you know, by the next week, it jumps up to, you know, 25, 30 spotted wing drosophila in a trap, and that's before all the June berries have been selected or have been harvested. So there's, there are some years in which June berries can be quite susceptible. Um, now, in years in which June berries may ripen earlier, you know, it may not be as much of a problem but they're kind of right on the cusp there. <clears throat> Sour cherry. Sour cherry is pretty much devastated. You're starting to see 15, 15 18 spotted wing drosophila, you know, right about the time that you're picking, but it's, it ramps up before it's fully ripe. So in this time period, spotted wing drosophila can fully devastate um, the sour cherry crop. So I have to admit, I'm not, I'm not recommending sour cherry to, to North Dakota producers or producers in this region right now unless you're willing to spray the heck out of the crop. So that's showing you, I mean, just a, a little bit of kind of the research that we're doing that's trying to look at timing in fruits. Now we've got, you know, other crops we're looking at like grape and, and currant and, and other crops like that. But... What we're finding is that if you can have crops that mature early, um, you're better off. 
So that's another reason to plant has caps. Um, when you're selecting your strawberries, you may be better off looking at June bearing strawberry rather than ever bearing. Um, so if, now if this trend holds um, and spotted wing drosophila doesn't show up in the state until July, then maybe you know a good portion of your strawberries will escape infestation. You know the same is true of of your raspberries. Um, so the earlier your variety, um, the less risk there is to you. When it comes to others uh, like plums, I would make sure to pick your plums before they get too soft. Once they start to get really soft, then it's easier for spotted wing drosophila to puncture it. Um, so I mentioned tart cherries may be a lost cause. And then apples we're not too worried about at this point, as long as the skin doesn't split. We're probably not too worried about grape either. Um, so far, the only cultivar of grape that we've seen some infestation in has been valiant. So other, you know, other points, you know, make the environment less hospitable to the insect. So going back to our other tools, you know, remove your wild hosts, particularly if you're a commercial orchard. The wild hosts are going to serve as bridge crops to sustain spotted wing drosophila, you know, until your, uh, your domestic crops are ripe. So if you've got wild raspberries growing in the area, remove them, remove your choke cherries, your buckthorn. These are all going to sustain spotted wing drosophila until the time that your fruits are ready in your orchard. If your fruits are planted to, next to a wooded area, you're going to have more problem. So remember, I talked about spotted wing drosophila liking shaded areas. Uh, that's very true. So your woods are going to you know, provide um, shelter for spotted wing drosophila. They may go back to the wooded area during the hottest part of the day and then come back and infest your fruits at night. Now, I, I have a hard time making these recommendations because, you know, I, I firmly believe in, in planting flowering crops in your shelter belt to sustain pollinators. So here I'm having a hard time you know, telling people to remove wild hosts when we definitely want more flowers, more flowering shrubs out in the environment. Um, but we're seeing that this can be very problematic when it comes to um, orchard production. Pruning. Pruning is very important. So we want to make sure we prune the canopy, you know, whether it's a shrub, whether it's your, your grapes. We want to open up that canopy uh, to ensure that there's a lot of ventilation within the plant and we want to make sure that light gets into the plant. Now that generally improves the health of your fruit crop, but it also makes the environment hotter and less humid for uh, spotted wing drosophila. So important to make sure you're pruning the canopy. <coughs> And then if you have irrigation lines, make sure you repair any leaking irrigation lines because that will provide the water that spotted wing drosophila needs, needs. And then make sure to harvest every day or two. If you are a homeowner and you're neglecting your crops, I'm, I'm also worried that you are creating an environment that can lead to infestations of your neighbors, you know, whether your neighbor is a homeowner or your neighbor is a commercial producer. If you are going to neglect your fruit crops, if you're not going to spray, if, if your planting is going to become a source of infestation, I think it's then going to be better for you to remove your fruit crops rather than allow them to become a source to infest your neighbors around you. So, you know, some very important points to think of. <clears throat> okay, if you don't want to be spraying in pesticides, you might want to invest in some exclusion, net, in exclusion netting. So Dale Isla Riggs out of New York has been lecturing across the country about her use of exclusion netting. So she has been, um, <clears throat> she has been netting her fruit crops I have to admit it's not cheap. She is using ProtectNet, which is the brand. Now, in a lot of her presentations, she's saying that she's using an 80 gram weight netting. This is, I've been corrected on this. She's, she's actually wrong on that. There's only a 70 gram uh, exclusion netting that's available through ProtectNet. But that's what she's using. 
it's a little costly. It can be seven to nine thousand dollars per acre, and that's the cost in 2014 and 15. I'm hoping in the future that the price of netting can come down, uh, but this this is a very effective way um, to beat spotted wing drosophila. Of course, you have to be very thoughtful in how you do this. You want to make sure that you've got you know, got some redundancies, making sure that you're protecting your entrances so you're not bringing in spotted wing drosophila every time you go in and out. If you do happen to have a fruit crop that um, requires insect pollination, then you have to have a strategy too because you might have to bring in um, bumblebee hives to pollinate your crops if they're netted. So you do have to think of those aspects. <clears throat> Other IPM measures, uh, mow the tall grass and weeds. Remember this can provide shelter. And then you may want to consider plastic, I'm sorry, fabric weed mats. So that's that black weed mat. What we've, we've been hearing about is that the pupa will sometimes drop from the fruit and then drop to the ground. If you have a weed mat that's black, the pupa may in fact fry on that mat. So they're starting to look more and more at weed mats as a potential for reducing um, the spotted wing drosophila that pupates. Sanitation is very important. Clean up all your dropped fruit and then carefully dispose of it. You're going to find that crushing isn't going to do the job. There's still going to be eggs and larvae in the crushed fruit. Burying, is, burying your crop is not going to work either. I'm sorry, burying your infested berries. In fact, the larvae have a great ability to dig through the soil, so you would have to go impossibly deep to bury your dropped fruit. I've heard some people use a, a kaolin spray, so that's kind of a clay spray that they use. Um, I, I don't know how effective that is. Probably your best bet is, okay, if you have a small amount of fruit, you can freeze it solid. That will kill any infested spotted wing drosophila. Or um, you can solarize the fruit. So you collect them, put them in a uh, plastic trash bag, and then let it just bake in the sun you know, for several days in the hot heat until you kill those insects. <clears throat> For those of you that sell at farmer's market, you may be concerned on whether you're selling infested fruit. There's a very easy test that you can do. What you can do is mix up a solution of salt and water, generally about one tablespoon of salt to one cup of water, and then you place in a representative sample of your raspberries or your cherries or whatever. You'll crush up the fruit and then allow the salt to act as an irritant. Uh, the SWD larvae will then float up to the surface and you'll be able to see, you know, roughly what the infestation rate is. So it's a good tip for those of you that may be selling at farmer's markets and want to make sure that you're selling produce that doesn't have spotted wing drosophila. Other things to think about would be um, refrigerating your produce as soon as you harvest it. So, you know, stick them in the refrigerator. And what that will do is, say for example, there are eggs that are laid or maybe even the tiniest instars, refrigeration will stop development. So your, your customers um, will, not, will not see the infestation. Uh, now if you're running a UPIC business, you know, tell your customers that they need to refrigerate their fruit. Very, very important um, for this reason. For those of you that are freezing your fruit to save for later, that's, that's a good way of preventing the eggs from hatching and the first instars from developing further. So all along I've been you know, telling you how to avoid spotted wing drosophila. Um, but what happens if you eat the larvae? Are you going to die? Are you going to be poisoned? What do you think out there? Well. You're not going to die. You're not going to be poisoned. It's just the yuck factor. So I like to tell a lot of people, it's added protein. It's all added protein. It's all good. <clears throat> so are you de thoroughly depressed now about the state of fruits in the northern Great Plains? Is there hope? Yes. Millions and millions of dollars are being spent nationally. They, they've got so many entomologists working on that. I'm hopeful that 
uh, I'm hopeful that we will come to live with this invasive pest. They're looking at different parasitoids uh, from Asia. So spotted wing drosophila comes from Asia, so they're looking at the native uh, parasite, parasites that would prey on spotted wing drosophila. They're also looking at natural predators here in the United States. There are predators that will eat spotted wing drosophila. So that's, there's more work being done on that, but it, that's not going to be the silver bullet, at least not now. They're looking at netting, as we mentioned, and then repellents. I was really, really quite optimistic when I read a, a new paper on butyl athranolate. This is, um, this is actually something they use as a food additive, meaning that humans can consume it, but maybe, maybe in the future you might be able to spray a repellent, such as BA, on your crop. It would be food safe and at the same time would deter spotted wing drosophila. We don't know if this is going to come to fruition, but there's, a, there's research being done on that, as well as new insecticides that would not be poisonous to humans. So they're looking at sugar alcohol types, um, uh, types of compounds like erythritol, which can be, in fact, very, um, very poisonous to different drosophila. They're looking at different traps and lures, looking at ways at doing mass trapping or using trap crops to kill insects. They're looking at genetic modification and also spraying the ground around the plants. So there's, there's more research coming up. Right now, mass trapping seems to be kind of striking out, but maybe, maybe doing a trap crop might work. Uh, so you'll be seeing more and more of this um, as we progress. So I wanted to acknowledge you know, our research team. Caitlin Kruger is our PhD student. Um, and then Jan Knodel, Harleen Hatterman Valenti, and I are on her committee. And we're also working with Kathy Wiederholt at the Carrington REC. So we are very thankful that the Carrington REC has allowed us to conduct research there. And then we thank the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, uh, which is administered through the North Dakota Department of Ag. <clears throat> So at this time, I'll take any questions or comments that you have. So you're welcome to, you're welcome to type them in the chat box, or if you have a microphone, um, that's certainly uh, something that you can use. So any questions out there? I know I covered a lot of information, um, but I wanted you to have the most recent information. So any observations? Are you seeing spotted wing drosophila? Yes, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Drew up here at Ray. Yes. I am horrified. <clears throat> With the Corps' permission, on and in around my land, I planted Juneberry, Choke Cherry, Buffalo Berry, my small grouping of 25 current is thriving, and of course I have plum and tomato and asparagus, Mary Washington, that does in fact uh, have the female. <laughs> <laughs> the female berries, yes. Yes, and, and, and I have seen those seed and I have planted from those. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they're here or not, but since I'm only a half mile from the extension service here, I presume we're going to be, we're close enough to be uh, cross infesting each other. You know, th there's a possibility, but I, I would assume that your REC is controlling spotted wing drosophila. Now, you have an advantage that we don't, Drew. Drew is from western North Dakota. We do see that spotted wing drosophila does not do as well in, in areas that are much drier. So I believe that your area is going to do better because you're on the drier side of the state. Infestations won't be as bad. We worry a lot more in areas where we receive a lot more rainfall. 
So we don't quite know how bad things are going to be. You know, out in western North Dakota, so far we haven't been hearing a whole lot, which, which leads me to believe that spotted wing drosophila may be more of a problem in wetter areas of the state rather than Williston. Um, so there's hope. There's, there's hope on, on that side of the state. Thank you. I need hope. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm seeing questions um, from Beverly to everyone. Are you wanting reports from anyone trapping? Now, if you happen to be in one of these other counties, here I'm going to just kind of, where we don't have, um, here, I'll go back to the map here. We are looking for samples from other counties so we can fill in the, ma the distribution map. So I'm sorry, it's towards the beginning here. Oops, there we go. So if you're from one of the counties that is in white or light blue, yes, we are looking for, for samples to confirm the distribution that does give us information. So good question, Beverly. Question from Joan, where do we get the yellow sticky traps? Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the company. It might be Gempel or was it? Uh, Leonard, um, th there are horticultural supply companies that have it. Any insect supply company would have it. They're very cheap. You could probably even get them on Amazon to tell you the truth. You know, just, just Google yellow insect sticky traps. They're very, very much widely available. The only thing is that they are really sticky. So, you know, be careful. Um, Lindy Berg. Oh, yes. Lindy Berg says, yes, you can get the trap supplies at Amazon. <clears throat> Other questions? There's a question from Jamestown. Yes. Yes. Um, is mulch in raspberries a bad idea, like hay or straw on the ground to keep the weeds down? Well, they're, they're doing research on that. They, they are finding that the black, well, it's, I think it's kind of um, a double-edged sword. You know, the black, um, Weed mat it does it does cause those pupa to dry up, but at the same time, I think they're researching whether the mulch provides habitat for the natural predators. So we don't necessarily have a clear picture yet on the role that mulch plays, but it is possible that natural or that mulch may in fact provide habitat for predators that may then eat the pupa and and prey on spotted wing drosophila. So that's still being researched. We don't have, I, I don't think there has been a conclusion on that aspect. But great question. You know, frankly, as a horticulturist, we say mulch everything. So <laughs> I, would, I would hate to just go to, to a weed mat all the time. Uh, we, do like to, we do like to amend the soil and think about soil health concerns and, and moisture retention. <clears throat> So how's that for a wishy-washy answer? <laughs> Other questions or comments? So how bad, how bad is spotted wing drosophila where you live? Esther? Yes. This is Cecilia from Jamestown. And we definitely have it in our raspberries. Um, and my neighbor who's watching this with me does as well. And, um, but, you know, if, if you do follow those practices and pick early and pick often, it's not so bad. And we need one of us, my friend and I are still living and we've eaten plenty of larvae. So, you know, if you just don't look. Celia, I just absolutely love you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> Um, but it is, it's, it's, it's kind of depressing, but um, hopefully the research will help. Um, so. Yes, we're hoping, we're hoping, because we don't want to just be spraying all these, all these pesticides. That's not what we're about. Um, but, but great point, you know, pick early, pick often, you know, make sure you're not giving them more time to lay eggs. That's, that really is the key, particularly for homeowners, um, rather than spraying the heck out of it. Anybody else?
Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be, we're going to be posting the recording on our, on our website. Oh, I'm seeing another question in the chat box. Uh, Beverly has them in Glen Allen. So yes, that's getting more towards the western area of the state. I think Glen Allen is in Morton County, if I'm not mistaken. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit drier, but maybe not as dry as Williams County. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, uh, this will be our last webinar of the uh, NDSU High Tunnel Community of Practice series for the season. We'll start up again in the fall. Master Gardeners will have other webinars, but they'll be more Master Gardener focused. Thank you very much, and um, have a good day.